All right. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining today's webinar on convenience store operations execution in 2020, where we're going to explore some survey findings um, that Zimput and Technomic uh, found uh, earlier this year around convenience store ops, uh, so discussing barriers and opportunities. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. We will be recording today's session and we'll follow up via email with that recording. Um, and we'll also hopefully have some time at the end for Q&A. So please feel free to submit any questions throughout the presentation in the questions pane of GoToWebinar. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, one of our presenters and moderator, Vladek Richter, CEO of Zimput. Thanks, Cassie. Thanks for uh, thanks everyone for joining this morning or this afternoon, depending on uh, what part of the country you're in. Um, uh, I'm looking forward. Let me let me start off initially here and introduce uh, Melissa Wilson. Melissa, I'd actually like to actually I'll let you do the introduction for yourself in terms of uh, a little bit on your background and uh, uh, and technomic itself, and then we'll uh, dig in further into the into the presentation. Sure. Thanks, Vlad. Um, everyone, this is Melissa Wilson. I'm a principal in Technomics Advisory Practices and work with our um, operator clients in both the restaurant and a uh, broader array of food service um, on a variety of engagements related to operations, um, marketing, strategic initiatives, and so on. Wonderful. And, um, and I'm Vladek Richter. I'm um, the CEO and one of the two founders of, of Zenput. Um, uh, we uh, sorry, we hit that one. Um, we uh, we provide a solution into the uh, convenience store uh, industry, uh, specifically around the way that um, uh, we manage all of our operations day to day. That could mean food safety compliance, brand standards compliance, marketing, promotional compliance. Uh, working with, I believe right now it's 27 out of the top 100 uh, convenience stores uh, based on uh, location count. Um, but um, I think today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into. Uh, pandemic kind of increasing the um, the operational complexity here. Um, and I think there are, are, are kind of um, three things that, uh, as, as we get going uh, in this in terms of uh, where we're seeing, and I think in the work that we've done with uh, Melissa and Technomic on um, the challenges uh, that we're seeing day to day on the operational side, right? One is around enhancing uh, the sanitation and uh, social distancing processes uh, on a regular basis. Uh, two is around the self-serve self-service format restrictions, right? And obviously there's no shortage of self-service foods that we have out there today that are being restricted by this, right? Be they beverages, roller grills, you know, soup, chili, cheese stations, condiments, bakery, so on and so forth. And then the last one around the emphasis on off-premise formats and the need to be able to have drive-through or pickup along the way. Um, so, so moving forward under this, I think um, there we go. As a as a starting point, um, is the uh, webinar poll, and I think the first question is to just kind of understand a little bit of as you continue to respond to COVID nineteen, what's the uh, biggest operational challenge uh, facing the company? going through. Okay, I think it's, there we go. I think it's maybe missing on the, on the results coming through here. Sorry about that, maybe a little bit of a, uh, a, a technical challenge. We'll have to come, uh, come back to this one uh, to begin with. But Melissa, I think I'd rather kind of uh, uh, pass this along to you and kind of dig in a little bit on the um, on the, the methodology and the results, and kind of let you take it from here and, and drive it moving forward. Sure, absolutely, and, and thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. For um, for everyone in the audience that's listening, um, today we're going to be presenting the results from a study that we conducted uh, on behalf of Zenput. Uh, uh, actually, actually, it was completed right before pre-COVID, and that's why we definitely wanted to acknowledge that there's been some additional complexities added during the COVID times, and we'll be uh, talking about some of that impact as we go through the slides from the survey. <clears throat> to give you a, a perspective of uh, the methodology for the study, um, Technomic has rich resources, uh, extensive uh, secondary data about the food service industry and the food service consumer. So with any project, we uh, mine that data to bring the relative relevant insights and examples to the study. Um, Zenput had in the past conducted an operations survey with their own customer base, and we augmented that with an extensive 
uh, panel of our own um, C store operators, um, and then went through and of course with any study we analyze it and identify what they what's the so what what are the key implications, and we'll sh share with you on the next slide what the uh, composition of the audience was because I know that's a question that always comes up. Um, so the pool of survey partic participants included operations leaders uh, of C store operations, and that includes titles such as VP, director, uh, C suite. Uh, individual uh, independent owner, et cetera, um, operations managers, uh, field leaders, store managers, and procur procurement, basically uh, everybody that participated in the survey, definitely involved in the operations and in key decisions about uh, operational procedures and operations execution. And again, very important element of this is that uh, the ma vast majority, overwhelming majority of respondents have a food service component in their operation, um, including retail food products, hot fresh food products, actually um, almost 90% uh, offer hot fresh food products, cold fresh food products, et cetera. So uh, myriad, uh, sort a mix of uh, different concept sizes from smaller operators to some of the largest C store chains out there. And just sharing this background with you so that you understand that this is a representative sample um, of the industry with key decision makers in and execution leaders in the operations arena. So let's talk about what the results were that we found. And we asked these operations leaders a number of questions about what were key concerns, um, what was the level of execution being done as intended, what they were spending their time on, what were their key concerns overall with ensuring that uh, operations were executed as intended. And one of the overriding findings was that we had some core areas that bubbled up. Um, store level execution, definitely a pain point, and labor costs a pain point. If you think about uh, coming into the year 2020, labor has been one of the biggest issues, not only in the food service industry, but also in retail um, service industries, et cetera, because of the very uh, low levels of unemployment uh, that coming into the beginning of 2020. Um, and that situation we're going to touch on as well as we go through this in terms of what that, that scenario looks like now. Um, but no question that within the um, C-store industry, store, step, store level execution was a key concern. We asked them what, were, what are their, your top barriers to being consistent on your execution arenas. And the number one is that just not identifying issues at the stores early enough. Um, operators too mired down in the day to day and not necessarily seeing trends that might be happening um, and communicating them to their leadership quickly enough to take action. Rising labor costs, I already touched on that. And um, we'll, again, we'll talk about that and the impact related to that uh, from COVID-19 um, moving forward. Um, not all stores correctly following operational procedures, especially when you think about uh, multi-unit operations. Um, training can be sometimes, in some cases, limited. Training not always consistent from location to location. And then that supervisory element, um, if they're focusing more on the cost perspectives or focusing more on employee training. And again, that point that I mentioned that issues of the store not being resolved fast enough, and a lot of that has to do with issues not being identified uh, quickly enough. So if we can go on to the next slide. There you go. I've more, more technical difficulties this morning than I've actually anticipated, so sorry about that. Yeah. Well, and so one of the things that we wanted to think about when we talked about rising labor costs, you know, Vlad, what what is it about convenience stores that makes it so important to execute at the store? Yeah, is okay. it a competitive I, situation, a brand mm -hmm. image? You know, what's 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 at the heart here, and what are you seeing? I, I think what we're seeing, uh, especially nowadays, uh, from a regional perspective, is the brand image. Right, so um, if a brand of uh, a given, uh, if a brand of a give, uh, given convenience stores is known to always have to say clean bathrooms, people will go out of their way to find that location, right? And with the difficulties that uh, operators face retaining well-trained and experienced employees, it becomes even more important to make sure that those stores are executing well and sort of living up to the brand promise that they have um, uh, to their to their customers, to their consumers in that area <clears throat> of what they're trying to deliver on, right? Um, and I, th I think within that, you know, we see both a, a mix of people that are, you know, trying to double down on that and going, well, we can't lose our steam at this point. We can't lose and make sure that 
uh, that that those uh, that that brand image that uh, we're well known for all of a sudden disappears. Um, and I, and I, I see that a lot more these days as people are trying to find you know ways and the conversations we have them trying to find ways to make sure that they're not losing touch with the consumer. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point because when you think about it, um, C stores are your mobile, you're on the road, you're on the go. Um, thinking about looking forward um, as we come out of this uh, lockdown, uh, it's, there's reports that uh, many more consumers are planning road trips for for getaways as um, different areas of the country start to reopen. So um, what you see at one particular location of a C-store is certainly going to impact your perception or likelihood to stop at the next one from that brand um, as you travel down on your road. You know, if the restrooms are not clean or the uh, team is not uh preparing food properly at one location, looking ahead, less likely to stop at that location, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, the, the impact on that's usually great, right? The, the, the thing with sort of a bad brand experience is that it sticks with people, right? Um, all of a sudden, if you've elevated somebody to a certain level and you uh, believe that that's the case of uh, what they're usually delivering, once, <clears throat> once that delivery is lost, you know, one time, probably two or three times if someone gives you a break, um, you, you lose that trust, right? And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're looking at it going, well, I don't trust that place anymore, right? I've lost that trust and that connection uh, to that brand, yeah. right? So I think that yeah. the, it's an important element that we're seeing um, that we're seeing a lot more on the doubling down from operators and in, um, in previous years because this is what this is what their sort of um, uh, their their trust and also their, their their lifetime value of those consumers is built on. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, let's let's unpack this next slide that you've put up here. You know, um, and again, this study was completed before we ended up with this unique situation that we're facing in, in 2020 with with the lockdowns. Um, and even before that, um, operators were not confident that their stores were compliant with procedures. Um, again, think about this: only one out of four C store operators thought that their stores were effectively or very effectively complying with operating procedures. And that was before you added the additional complexities that you noted, Vlad, that have been imposed due to the COVID-19 situation with these additional um, policies and requirements and important elements of additional sanitation, um, uh, managing consumers with their social distancing, um, having to put together orders for off-premise for delivery or for curbside pickup when you have a very limited staff. So um, certainly really, really challenging when you think about it. Um, you know, it seems that operators just didn't have the confidence and compliance before. Really more concerning situation moving forward because the new um, facets that have been imposed are um, not just related to brand image, but really the safety of employees as well, as well as the consumers. So only one out of four these rappers felt their stores were uh, very effectively complying with procedures. And perhaps not surprisingly, on average, more than a third of stores were not complying with training processes. And it seems to me that probably not complying with what's uh, communicating what's the why behind why certain procedures are in place. Almost a third not in compliance with just table stakes, core operating procedures, and one out of five not in compliance with new product rollouts. So again, we think th these concerns are uh, significantly elevated uh, as we come out of the COVID-19 lockdowns because it's going to be essential to maintain that consumer confidence or build that consumer confidence um, in the safety, safety and sanitation procedures. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I think it's um, um, it, it's tough in these and, uh, environments to kind of uh, to execute to begin with, right? And I, th I think in general, um, I think in general we see uh, uh, operator operation leaders having you know, really specific ways they want things to be done within their locations. And unfortunately, right now they just have to like, sort of cross their fingers that their teams in each store will do it right, given the volume of work that they're having to get done as a whole, right? And so they're probably not confident that things are getting done correctly. That makes sense, you know, the, the sort of, you know, um, uh, only one out of four feeling confidence uh, to begin with, because it, it seems, especially with, uh, with with the COVID implication, even on top of it, um, it's just, it's it's tough to manage, right? You're asking people to do a lot of different things on a regular basis, and it's and it's tough for them to try to get all these things accomplished. Yeah. Yeah, so let's let's unpack this a little bit more um, and talk about, you know, I talked a little bit about risk with, with safety, just in sanitation, but let's talk about food safety. Um, you know, another key finding, you know, we know 
we know not only food safety is critical, everybody in the food service industry understands food safety is critical. We've all watched what has happened to brand reputations and business when food safety isn't taken seriously. All we have to do is think about Chipotle to take a look at what has happened there. So a critical to business, but um, operators, and again, this is pre-COVID, feeling vulnerable. A vast majority of sea stores now offer hot and cold fresh food products, and this has been a significant initiative in the sea store space to really start to compete more aggressively with quick service restaurants and add to um, uh, fresh food and on both a hot and cold front offerings to, because definitely products are, um, have higher margins than your packaged goods on the shelf. So um, not surprising that operators feeling pressure when it comes to food safety if they're not convinced about overall store compliance. But what we found in the study is operators were telling us that about a quarter of their stores were not complying with food safety protocols. And more than two thirds agree that a customer food safety issue could put their business at risk. Um, so the ability to quickly identify food safety issues and proactively address them before they negatively affect the customer really important for mitigating uh, these scenarios. So we also found that, um, again, to the point early on that operators were not confident about being able to identify issues early when it came to food safety. Um, almost a third said that they, uh, on, only a third, less than a third, said that they were confident that their operation would be able to identify any potential food safety concerns before they became an issue. So glad, even though sea stores main offering isn't usually food, um, as I mentioned, many sea stores are offering more and more food, are looking at adding going forward. So for operators that are increasing their food offerings, what should they do? How do they start off to uh, enforce and develop uh, and integrate strong food safety practices? Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, it, 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 when you're going to most no food safety procedures, you know, no offering uh, fresh food uh, at one store or two stores, and then you're trying to scale it up to, you know, 50, 100, 200, um, you, you feel a bit uh, vulnerable, right? Because you're not sure exactly the process needs to run through it. And, and even sometimes less of so the process, it needs to be seeped into the culture, right? It needs to be a part of um, the, the things that people care about on a regular basis, uh, because those those incidents can really hurt uh, the um, the brand's reputation. Right? We know that there are um, uh, really phenomenal kind of uh, regional players today that um, you know be in the Midwest, be in the Northeast, the Southeast, that have done a great job kind of building their, um, a lot of the brand reputation on on food and food safety uh, to go along with it. Um, and so we almost have kind of a, uh, a new a new understanding of those businesses that we wouldn't have had you know say 30 years ago, um, or 20 years ago. Um, and so I think operators just need a simple way to streamline these things on a regular basis is what we hear from them, is make sure the communication and the verification that are being done uh, exist uh, regularly, uh, because at least it gives them some sort of peace of mind and it starts to build a culture of habit and a culture of execution and a culture of excellence that um, specifically in a, new, uh, in a new initiative may not have been there and you may not just have the muscle memory uh, to do it. Um, and so that, that becomes a, 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 a deeply, a deeply important, um, a deeply important part, right? Um, so let's um, let's proceed forward here. I'm going to uh, hop over to um, next one. I'm going to skip given the the issues I'm having with the polls. Kind of keep moving straight to the um, uh, to the fourth one here. Mostly. Yeah, absolutely. We can always send out polls when the uh, for for those that download the deck as well. So so I think your your point about keeping it simple is really smart. You know, because that's an easier way to get things done and assimilated into this into the system that also um looks like key, com key component as well is thinking about how your supervisors and managers are uh and corporate are keeping tabs on what's happening at the store level so you know a lot what, what we found in the study is that a lot of field employees time is really being consumed by the audit process and it seems that the time investment isn't really having the intended impact while the audits are essential to ensuring that a consistent experience is uh, executed across all locations, most operators the study found didn't feel as though the audits were being completed very effectively at the store level. Um, in fact, only 15%, that's one out of seven, I think, 
um, CSOAR operators felt that audits were being performed very uh, effectively. Gosh, if we were giving this a grade, that would be definitely a hard F, right? Um, yeah, and one of, yeah, I mean, one of, and who wants to be thinking about their company's operations as being monitored and checked up on at an F grade, not 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 a way to build to build the business. So, one of the reasons that we found behind that is that um, the operators were saying that their field employees were spending too much time on low value tasks. You know, look at the opposite number: eighty three percent, vast majority think that that's the case is that they're being mired with preparing reports and following up with stores to be ensure that issues have been corrected. Um, spending nine hours per week preparing reports to submit to headquarters and nine hours per week just on that follow-up. Um, so a lot of time being just mired with uh, just rote tasks that are not really contributing. So when you combine that, um, and field employees are spending almost half of their work week on low value tasks. And interesting, when you think about the costs that we talked about before, the labor costs, you know, field employees are paid at a higher level as well. And to not have their uh, half of their work week being done on high value tasks is um, not uh, effective in terms of uh, building the business or maintaining profitability. So um, given the time on the low value tasks, um, you know, seems there's significant opportunity. So Vlad, uh, tell, tell us what you're finding as you talk with operators. Do these numbers sound right? Is that what they're seeing? I mean, this is pretty polarized in terms of low effectiveness um, out there with the field teams. Yeah, it's it, it's a little it's um it's it's one of those areas for improvement for sure. So I, look, I think when you have a lot of locations, right? Again, sort of um, you get to the state of having you know 50, uh, 100, 500, 1,000. It, it's hard to have uh, audits perform and get um, actionable insights from those audits on a regular basis. But right? I think what, what kind of what we saw in the previous question about methods of visibility into store operations. You know, if you're using uh, manual processes, if you're load, learning things around and you know, manually writing them down and trying to track them and you're trying to get on the phone calls it's really hard to get a lot of value out of your auditing um and further like you know if an audit finds some sort of issues how are you going to uh you know find a way to close the loop on it right make sure that hey I, I walked out of this location and i found that you know there's an issue with that bathroom which implies back to the brand image problem that i need to make sure that it's been resolved and it's been cleaned and i need to make sure that it's done in the next two hours or three hours um you're likely walking out and probably forgetting about it. Maybe you'll call back later that night or maybe you'll call back in the morning, uh, but that sort of closing the loop um, is, a, is an important piece. Um, and how long does that end up taking if um, if you don't have some sort of technology in place to begin with, right? Yeah, and so um, as, I, as I mentioned a second ago, you know, the data showed that field employees are spending um, almost half the work week, uh, av averaging 18 hours on reports and following up. Do you think that's a good use of their time? And if not, where can they be spending their time more effectively? Yeah, uh, look, you know, as, uh, as someone, as I was just telling uh, Melissa before we got on this call, I uh, needed a printer for something. I, I, have, I have a printer in my house. I don't think we've used it in probably uh, two years at this point. I'm a, I'm a believer in, uh, in technology and moving things forward and becoming more efficient. So I, I think the reality for, for, uh, for, these field pe for these field team members is that they can be, you know, a lot of the things they're spending time on uh, can be done much better and much faster with technology, right? Where the real value of them is going to come uh, in experience uh, in training new team members, right? How they're uh, how they're talking to them, how they're making sure that they're part of the culture, how those team members are interacting with customers. That's where they're likely to make the most positive impact on the business, right? The sort of um, the sort of administrative processes and the reporting process that they've run. They're obviously important for the business, right? You, you can't get insights into that, um, but the reality is that finding ways uh, to remove those. Um, and, and put those into a more technology-oriented solution so that you can focus on more high-value efforts uh, with your teams, that's, that, that's where that needs to exist. The more you can invest in your culture, the more it'll be seen within the brand and the more that the customers will end up coming back to that location. Right. Yeah, and no, no question. And I'm also thinking that, again, as we come out of the COVID-19 lockdowns too, Gosh, uh, just to, being sure that your employees how how they're doing, you know, are are ensuring that they and their families are keeping safe and they're they're uh, well, uh, how they're feeling about the situation and what additional challenges they might be facing keeping customers social distancing. So maybe opening up more time for the field managers to really talk with their team to find out what they're experiencing. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Hundred percent. 
Yeah, no, Vlad, you you talked, you mentioned, uh, you, you've been talking a lot about technology as an opportunity to, to streamline things. And let's uh, share here what the, uh, again, what our study found. In no question, um, we found that there is room um, for embracing automation um, of the C stores that, C store operators who say that their operation has embraced automation at least somewhat. Um, 98% said that their experience has been positive. Um, and so what we are finding that only 27% of operators, however, said that their company is embracing technology to automate various aspects of their organization to a great extent. And in fact, we, as, as the data shows here, you know, when we ask, how are you getting visibility into store unit level operation execution? Uh, vast majority is phone calls, text messages, email, um, and actually a, a very healthy percentage there um, of still running those paper checklists, although I have to think that that's going to have to change um, post-COVID-19 as well. So when you talk about operate automation, Vlad, when thinking of C-store operators, what types of technology come to mind? What are the opportunities for them to digitize and automate? Yeah, so I, I think it's um, sort of kind of a, a three-stage process, right? Um, we see people moving from some manual, you know, um, uh, processes, right, where there's pen and paper, to a digital process initially, and then ultimately uh, to one around automation. Uh, sometimes hard to skip from one to the other one if, um, if you haven't taken the steps in between, right? Um, so I, you can sort of think of this, um, maybe a couple of examples uh, come, come to mind. Uh, think about it from a time uh, temperature monitoring uh, perspective initially, right? Um, you know, step one is you've got a manual uh, device in there. Um, you can sort of read the temperature, right? That, that's, we've probably moved from manual ones uh, to digital ones. Now you still have people running around and they're looking at the digital um, thermometer. They're seeing the actual temperature at the moment and they're capturing that and they're putting that into another, uh, into another system. And then naturally the third level of that is uh, real-time uh, remote monitoring that's automated where you know there, there, there's time savings of the individual not having to check things. There are alerts, there are foundations that are built off of off of the uh, off of the temperature being outside of a certain bound that uh, then uh, that it should be within, and then that that creates you know potential workflow for maintenance people, that potential uh, create workflow for the general manager, for the store manager. I, I think those are um, those are uh, incredibly important. And what we're seeing now more on the, on the food safety side is really even the automating the process of as you're uh, prepping product not just sitting there and making sure that you've got uh, the expiration date on there, but the correct one that you're doing it through some sort of technology, right? So instead of having to manually do, uh, doing some math in your head at all times, like, well, today's, you know, Wednesday uh, at, um, at 1 p.m. Eastern, and this is good for three days. So that means it should expire on, you know, Saturday at 1 p.m. And um, finding a way to remove that so that, that that process can be a bit more automated, right? Well, so maybe, maybe back in, in return, you know, you talk to a lot of companies who are starting to digitize, you know, operational work. What are these numbers telling you and, and, and what are the implications, right? Well, great, great question. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Our industry's been slow to adopt technology but over the last couple of years in automation, but over the last couple of years, we're starting to see a lot of momentum gained. We definitely expect to see even more momentum gained after this COVID-19 crisis. So, you know, some of the things to think about with the automation, I mean, to your point, not only the, the efficiency, but also food safety. I mean, paper checklists need to be done. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not going to be safe in the post-COVID-19 environment. Um, but also just think about the labor turnover we have at some local locations and companies, unfortunately. Um, or if there's a food safety issue, having a paper trail is going to make it that much more difficult to get into contact tracing or to... Uh, identify the trail of what has been um, executed at the location versus not. Um, automation, uh, definitely the companies that have embraced it, they're finding that it allows their their team to focus more on that customer interaction and on the, on the bigger picture of hospitality and service. Um, and of course, post-COVID-19, safety and sanitation as well. Yep. So let, let's take a look at what the operators that have um, embrace automation, um, what they are finding. So those that um, have embraced automation to a great extent, definitely telling us that they are seeing better outcomes. In fact, 98% say that their experience has been a positive one. 
and the areas that they are most seeing an impact. So let's look at um, how this chart breaks down the the the, the uh, scale, the the graph that shows the lighter color. That's those that are not embracing automation. The darker color is those that are embracing automation to a great extent. And we're seeing huge differentials in terms of their outcomes here. So uh, we we just saw that data a minute ago about. A very limited insight into store compliance. Well, 93% of those embracing automation feel that they've got very clear visibility. And that's a 14 percentage point differential versus those that haven't embraced automation. The ability to quickly identify issues, remember that was one of the big concerns or pain points a little bit earlier in the study. 86% um, feel that using automation, they can very quickly identify these issues and also that they can follow up on them. Um, that question about audits being effectively performed it was just really abysmal results um, in terms of oh, broader industry confidence, 83% um, feeling uh, uh, very confident that the audits are effectively performed. And you, again, huge difference between those that are not embracing automation, 23%. Um, and then very confident or somewhat confident in the ability to identify food safety issues. This is way closer to what it needs to be in a food service environment at 95%. Um, very concerning that only 80%, that's one out of five, saying that they are not confident in um, food safety issues being uh, identified before, before they become an issue. So big differences here. So um, Vlad, anything that jumps out at you here in terms of the impact of using technology? Yeah, look, I, I think every aspect of an operation that you can automate uh, starts to really add up and can result in much more productive workforce or cost savings, right? Um, we, we've uh, historically, even as a, as a society, have always uh, talked a lot about productivity, right, and productivity gains, and those productivity gains are, are, are massive drivers uh, into the economy, and more importantly, the individual uh, uh, customer store level too, right? You know, we have a, uh, a C-store customer of ours, uh, time-wise, that found their store managers you know, increase their sales floor production by 10 to 15 percent simply because they spent less time on the computer in the back office and more time interacting with customers and employees. And that 10 to 15 percent production uh, or increase in, in, uh, in production is huge, right? I mean, it's, um, it's, uh, it's one more interaction that drives a better brand experience uh, for a potential uh, customer that, that's coming in. It likely put, turns them into, you know, maybe a, a lifetime lover of your brand and uh, being dedicated to your brand and continue to spend money there. Um, and I, I think ultimately that's, you know, that's the business that we're in, right? Um, we're, we're in the business of, uh, of retail and making sure that, you know, we can service our customers quickly and efficiently. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we see that, um, the, that sort of, you know, across the board, I think that those investments start to pile up to be pretty meaningful uh, over time. Yeah, no question. And when I think about it, you know, 10 to 15 percent increase in sales floor productivity, and that's huge. And that, talk, you know, I know one of the questions everybody always has is about ROI, but it sounds like uh, this client of yours has definitely been able to definitively call out that link to uh, generating a positive ROI by increasing sales floor productivity through specific app applications here. Yep, absolutely. Let's take yeah, so let's take a look at the future and what things like uh, look like going, going ahead. And again, we asked uh, um, operators in terms of what their top priorities are for improvement looking ahead. And no question, given the employee and store execution challenges that operators were facing pre-COVID-19 and certainly are uh, facing even more complex challenges now, not surprising that the same issues that um, were ranked lower in terms of confidence are high on the priority label. So when you think about it, um, task completion at the store, field team productivity, supply chain control, um, all top-sided priorities for operators. Formalizing, documenting guidelines and procedures and improving compliance, um, all top priorities. In fact, it's really fascinating to find all of these from a research perspective to see all of these aligned at such high levels um, because often you have one or two of these items that, that bubbles up but these are all truly interlinked with that having that confidence in execution and instituting those procedures so Vlad are you surprised by these priorities and why do you think these stand out 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, you know, the, I get the uh, the privilege of having um, you know a lot of conversations with uh, with operators on, on a regular basis, and um, I, I think there's just um, you know uh, pre-COVID and pre some of the economic hit that we've had, uh, you, you saw a lot of people just being uh, difficulty managing the, the turnover at their businesses, right? And so when you have turnover, that means you've got to constantly retrain people. If you've got to retrain them, you've got to make sure that they're getting the work done. And if they're not getting their work done naturally, that's that's going to impact the you know the, the the flow of the business. And so you have a lot of concerns that people really you know pre-COVID worry about this. Now what's happened post, uh, uh, sort of during COVID and probably likely to uh, for the foreseeable future is that you know everything that you've been sort of running as a playbook for the last 15, 20 years, everything from you know the, the self-service food bars, um, you know to the to the way people interact with each other in the store to even the density of people in the store. Um, has now changed, right? And so now you're uh, in an environment where you have to have agility and you have to have uh, the ability to change your processes, you know, maybe daily, but definitely weekly at a minimum in a lot of cases. And so uh, there's likely a lot more that's going to fall through the cracks, right? And so we're seeing people sort of come and raise their hand and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm worried about this. How do you think, you know, we can tackle the problem? How do you guys see others uh, tackling it? Because what we've been doing is sort of consistently, you know, doing things uh, quietly and peacefully over the course of the last 20 years while adding a little bit of something new every few months, all of a sudden turns into violent changes relatively quickly that force you to kind of go through and say, well, you know, what we were doing last week doesn't work anymore. We've got to change it up in a whole different direction. So it's, um, it's interesting. The, um, uh, I think um, not, not too much surprise there, and I think sort of in line with both uh, initially some of the labor challenges that we were having and now just the the general operational challenges that we're having given uh, COVID's impact. Well, thanks. Um, cool. And I think yeah, it's time to see what questions we have coming in. Yeah, of course. And it looks like I'll, um, I will take uh, I will take a uh, look at some of these questions we posted these through. So, okay, first one is, uh, um, you know, how, how are folks actually, how are uh, operators, dealing with making their food offerings safe, such as uh, beverage dispensers, roller grills, and bakery items. Yeah, so I, I, think, what, I think what we've seen on this is um, uh, a heavier focus on the sanitation procedures and the cleanliness procedures on a regular basis. Um, we shared this, uh, uh, we shared this uh, statistic uh, recently with, uh, with some customers, but we have seen, that's actually pretty interesting, we, we have seen nearly a doubling um, in terms of the amount of uh, sort of task and um, operational procedures that are being run at customers with uh, more than 70 stores in the last two months, right? So if you were doing four checks a day, you're now doing eight. If you were doing three, you're now doing six. If you were doing six, you're now doing 12, right? Um, and I, I think until we get to some sort of a new normal with some of this, um, and we understand it's kind of built in our behavior of how we need to make sure that we're uh, watching the food offerings. Um, this is in the, in the food safety rounded. Um, this is what's necessary for us to go through and do. Right. Uh, let's dig into maybe another one on here. Um, you know, can can uh, does that put help out help roll out COVID nineteen procedures? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, we uh, uh, shortly I think it was. Um, probably around the late March, early April timeframe, we had uh, worked with some uh, professionals in the space that uh, kind of came together and said, hey, you know, what's best and what do we need to do for kind of COVID-19 procedures? And we rolled those out to all 500 plus customers that we have. And I think the vast majority of the customer base took that and ran with it in different directions, right? So they uh, they sort of tweaked them to uh, fit a little more of their brand promise and, and their operational standards versus some other ones. Uh, but absolutely, I think that's become one of the uh, strong use points uh, today, uh, both from um, the fact that we can uh, kind of come come to you with some uh, templatized abilities, but then more importantly, the the agility and the speed necessary to roll out new ones as those changes uh, arise. Right. And I think we got uh, we've got one one more here. Uh, what are some ways that uh, other operators are making both employees and customers feel safe when they're coming into stores. Yeah, wellness checks, I think are probably uh, number one on that. Um, not, not so much for the customer, more so for the employee. 
Uh, so uh, making sure that employees know that um, everyone else has been checked and that their temperature, um, their, their temperature's in line and it's uh, obviously not, uh, not sparking anything uh, too high to uh, be concerned if it is, obviously send them home. Um, so wellness checks are, 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 are right up there as the immediate one. And I think the one just after that is sanitation procedures, right? Some way to both show and speak to the customer and the employees that, hey, we're, we're really watching, you know, the, the tabletops in here. We're really watching um, uh, the, uh, you know, the point of sale. And if you've got to interact with it and you've got to, uh, you've got to touch the pen that's on there, you know, having to wipe down. I, I was in a, I was in a bakery uh, a couple of days ago, actually, and uh, they were using a, a point of sale that was touchscreen, you know, to, to sign on it. And right next to it, um, they had a stack, or maybe kind of a box, of kind of single use, very small, maybe they were one inch by one inch square, uh, so one inch by one inch um, uh, little pads that would allow you to then wipe it off so that the, the, uh, uh, the person behind the register would then just take it after you were finished signing and just wipe down uh, the tablet that you were signing or whatever the touch screen was. And I thought that was great, right? So like to me, if I see someone going through that level of detail, right, and after every customer, they're quickly wiping that down, I have a lot more trust to come back there next time and know that likely whatever's happening behind the scenes, right in the back of the kitchen, is um, uh, is also going to be uh, is also going to be sort of thoughtful and, and well executed part. Um, yeah, well, yeah, and, and Vlad, I was uh, I'll just you know add to that too. I think your last point's really important is just sending those visible cues of safety and sanitation is going is really important uh, for the consumer as well to give them that confidence. Um, as well as as well as your team, you know, um, to ensure that they feel comfortable um, working in that environment on a daily basis. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think that brings us. We've got about uh, forty-five minutes in now. I think that brings us to the uh, uh, to the end here. Um, and just wanted to thank everyone for uh, for joining today, Melissa. Thank you very much for running us through this today. This was a, uh, as always, I think this is the second or third time we've done this together. Um, it's always a pleasure to do it with you. Um, so thank you for your time today. Always enjoy the conversation with you. Wonderful. And, and um, uh, uh, for those of you that are interested, there is a, uh, a free copy of the 2020 uh, Convenience Store Off Support uh, that you're uh, available for download. And uh, also this will be uh, sent out as a recording to, uh, to the rest of you to, uh, to watch later. But thanks again for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're based. And uh, we will uh, hopefully look forward to speaking with you in, in the future. Stay safe. Have a great rest of the day.